Do you have about the lab, interrupts, traps, anything that we, the quiz, anything that we've been, we've been looking at? There. Uh, the quiz, uh, the last two questions are troubling me. Uh, can you like go through what a um, run will look like? Uh, I'm, like I'm kind of lost on when the process can uh, like switch over. So if everyone is ready, um, do we need to wait uh, to complete the rest of the CPU time? Uh, you're talking about the one where you're at how many times time steps? Yeah. So in this scenario, uh, we can just kind of pick some, some other uh, attributes. So let's say process A has three CPU. Process B, one CPU, one I.O. that's going to take two steps to do, and process C, two CPU. And so if we're thinking about what does this sort of simplified model look like when we run these processes, at each step kind of time step, provided there is something the CPU could be doing, it's going to do one of the things it could be doing at that step. So at the first time step, what are what things could the CPU be doing? Running one of the three processes. Yeah, so it could be doing CPU work for any of the three processes. What the other thing to do? Ideally, are there IO for B? Yeah, so the other thing you could do at this point is to start an I.O. for process B. And we know since that I.O. is going to take two steps, process B is going to be blocked for the next two steps. It won't be able to do anything on step two or three. But our system is going to do something, which in this case, either CPU work for A or C. So, I don't know, maybe it does C. Then in step four, we can have a choice. All process C is done. We don't have anything left to do for that. But we could finish the I.O. for B, or we could do CPU work for A. And so this uh, is sort of how we're thinking about what the system is, is going to do. Um, and the question is asking you to think about how these operations could be arranged to complete all the work in the fewest steps or the kind of worst way to do it and take the most steps. Basically, the second part is how could you arrange this work to achieve the most CPU idle time? The most time steps where there's nothing to do because all currently running processes are blocked. Jim. Okay, so I'm wondering, so realistically, can you open like 10 IO processes? Like, is there a limit to how many IO processes can you like? Yeah, this is a, a, a good question. Uh, IO is a very general category. IO could be uh, printing, it could be reading or writing a file, it could be read or reading or writing data from the network, it could be uh, all sorts of different things. For a particular de device like a hard drive, there's going to be a limit to how many bytes that drive can read or write per second. And so, particularly in modern web servers where clients are connecting requesting some file or requesting some update that needs to involve the disk, the disk quickly becomes the bottleneck because the disk is much slower 
than most other parts of the system. And so yes, the operating system will need to have, or the disk itself will need to have some way to uh, buffer operations. I mean, keep track of what operations it needs to do next uh, when it finishes its current operation. Uh, and the amount of space for that is going to be limited. So yes, there will be a point where the IO device is completely occupied and you don't have any more space to buffer requests, so then maybe any future request you just have to block and wait until there is space to record this kind of new request in the queue in the line in the line of, of things waiting for this request. Okay. I have a question about the reading. So is the exec function um, basically just saying I'm gonna execute another function uh, while Yeah, so this is a preview of what we're talking about today, how to manage processes. The short version, this exec is a way to say, turn me, meaning the currently running process, into this other program. And we'll see uh, why we want that sort of operation uh, shortly. Sorry, if you're going to talk about this later, uh, you can just tell me so. But like, I'm confused. Why won't we just call the function? Like, why won't we just call the function pop instead of calling it? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll get to that. Okay. Other questions? All right, let's start out with a bit of practice. Well, that would make this challenging. <laughs> you consider connecting the Wi Fi? Apparently not. First question, how does the operating system know which code, like what instructions, should execute when an interrupt occurs? Let's see what we're thinking. All right, most of us thinking A. There are some votes for the, the nano elves. Uh, please, a uh, quick discussion with your neighbor. Uh, what you're thinking about the, the actual mechanism involved here. I support this. We should just rename the interrupt table the nano. Are we? I wonder. 
All right. Uh, <laughs> who can remind us what the uh, mechanism is called that is used to do this? Uh, Intro nanowells. Close. Uh, I do wish there were a little, like the the improvement in processor speed was that we had figured out how to make smaller and smaller elves inside the processor to handle <laughs> handle operations. Yeah, well. Uh, exactly. We have our interrupt vector table or trap table uh, that's set up at boot, and then an interrupt number is just an index into that table, which contains the address uh, of the code we're going to run. Does that make sense? Questions on that? I was wondering, like, how uh, the like, how do we know what the associated number is? Like, where do we store that information? Uh, so. What number is associated with a given interrupt, uh, that's determined by the hardware. So these interrupts, like the timer interrupt generated by uh, an actual circuit on the CPU, and the x86 architecture says, OK, interrupt number 12, or whatever it is, that is the timer interrupt. So when you set up this interrupt table, the thing in index 12 should be what handles the timer interrupt. Uh, and then the hardware. Uh, also needs to, to pick, say, some number that's going to be associated with system calls. And then that is what will be used to initiate the, the switch to, to kernel mode for a system call. So, um, the interrupts that we've been talking about are provided by this combination of hardware and software. And a significant amount of uh, how they work is just determined by Intel or whoever designed the, the CPU that you're running on. Other questions? All right. Next, uh, which of these four instructions would not be a privileged instruction? Uh, we have halt. Calls the CPU, uh, this load interrupt descriptor table, same thing as the interrupt vector table that loads the address of this table, uh, the int instruction to initiate an interrupt or trap, or a move instruction where the destination is a CPU control register, a register that uh, controls the behavior of the CPU. All right, give me your best guess. All right. All right, some uh, different ideas on, on this one. Please discuss with your neighbors why the ones that you think should be privileged would need to be privileged. <laughs> I but 
I just see an issue about convincing All right. If you're thinking something different than your original answer, now is your chance. All right, in this case, the user needs to be able to uh, initiate and interrupt. Uh, why does the user need to be able to do this, or why is this not a vulnerability? Oh. Does it not make system calls? And do you put the code in and you initialize it up? And then it's not a vulnerability because. You, you just want kernel code. Like you want kernel code to specific points that you know, so the users can't really exploit that at all unless the kernel is set up for them. Yes, exactly. That the user needs to be able to say, oh, "Do this system call to transfer the machine into kernel mode." And as we talked about last time, we don't have this interrupt instruction that lets it jump to just any arbitrary address and the arbitrary point in the kernel. It just jumps to one of these entries in our interrupt vector table. So it can only jump to the beginning of one of the handlers, so it has to jump to some trusted piece of kernel code uh, that can't just do an arbitrary operation. This move to a CPU control register, uh, why would that need to be privileged? So you can't just override arbitrary data in the system? We don't want the user to be able to just override arbitrary data. We in particular don't want the user to be able to elevate their own privileges, just be able to change the CPU into kernel mode, or to change which page stable the current process is using, so they get to access different memory. Uh, and so stuff that these CPU control registers are used to it uh, as part of enforcing a lot of the protections that we're relying on hardware to enforce. So we can't let user mode just change those. Oh, okay. Um, for uh, the correct answer of um, initiate and interrupt, um, is the user asking the OS to call the handler or to initiate, initiate the interrupt, or is the user initiating the interrupt itself? Uh, the user is initiating, so the user is doing two things. The user is saying, uh, put transfer control to the kernel, which puts the system to run in kernel mode. And then they also provide uh, an operand, which is, and execute the handler at this index in the interrupt table. Uh, so, this is how the uh, user is able to start a system call. So, they okay, put us in kernel mode and execute the system call handler that will then kind of dispatch to the appropriate system call. Yeah. Oh, what are the registers are considered like CPU control registers? Not like the regular ones, like REX or that's not. Uh, yeah, there are registers that start with CR and then. 0, 1, 2, 3. There's a number of them that control different things. You can look up what they are for the x86 processor. Um, uh, and yeah, they're not used for sort of normal data operations. Uh, they, um, they're used for things like what is the address of the page table that the current process is using to translate addresses, virtual addresses, to physical addresses. Uh, they uh, they're also where um, the uh, information about the most recent arithmetic operation is stored so that you can branch uh, based on that, uh, do jumps based on that. And we wouldn't want the, the user process to be able to directly change what's in there either because then they could mess with uh, how the, the branching instructions behave rather than having it operate based on 
the actual arithmetic operation. Other questions? All right. So what I want to talk about today is how processes are actually managed. What are the what are the actual operating system uh, functions that are going to uh, be used to do things like start a new process, uh, exit a process, things like that. So just in general, let's think about some things that uh, the operating system needs to do when starting a new process. So one of those We need to allocate and initialize our process control block uh, for an OSV terminology that's our proc struct. So when we create a new process, we need to allocate and initialize the structure we're using to keep track of information about that process. We need to allocate memory for that process. It's going to need uh, its own um, its own address space. The process has its private address space that is its own set of virtual memory addresses. If this process is running some new program, uh, what do we need to do? What's an important step in actually being able to run that program? The program's currently uh, a file on the disk. Okay. Load the code into memory. Exactly. If the program we're running, the, that code is sitting in a file on disk somewhere, we need to load it into memory so we can actually uh, execute those instructions. Um, and uh, last, uh, we need to uh, set up the stack for our process. Uh, last time, went through how we were using uh, the stack to uh, facilitate mode transfer. Uh, what was now? What is the the stack situation for uh, the typical process? Two stacks, one for the user, one for the kernel. Uh, exactly. We're going to have a user stack and a kernel stack for each process. Uh, so We want to set up uh, those stacks. Now, uh, these stacks might be in the, they're in the address space for the current process, but we actually need to set up stack pointers uh, to actually determine like where in that address space this process is going to locate its stack. Questions on these steps? Oh. Uh, yes. Yeah. So they're they're the same. Uh, I think you could. There would be different ways you could design, design it, but I think uh, a simple way would be uh, they're in the same address space, and the region that's the kernel stack is just per, uh, the user mode does not have permission to do anything to read or write that memory. Yeah, exactly. You just pick some fixed spot in the virtual memory and say, okay, above this point is only for the kernel. Before the kernel is running, how is it process 
So that's that's a good point. Uh, before the kernel is running, what code is going to create its process? Fortunately, the kernel is not a process. Uh, the kernel is just some code that we've loaded into memory that is running. We don't have uh, there's no process control block uh, or this other kind of metadata associated with the kernel. It's when the system boots up, kernel is loaded into memory, uh, and you looked at uh, uh, kind of a little bit of this in lab zero. There's kind of a main function that the kernel starts executing once we load it into memory. And that sort of sets up everything else that the system uh, will need to start running actual processes. Does that make sense? Okay. Does the kernel just get allocated like random memory when it starts up and then it protects that memory from other processes? Or does it have like a dedicated separate memory space that it uses each time? Uh, so it's when the kernel boots up, there will be some predictable chunk of memory that it gets allocated. So uh, I, I, it won't be random, most likely. Um, probably want it to be deterministic so that you can uh, uh, to keep things simple. Um, but yeah, the kernel will, uh, the, these kernel stacks are used to facilitate the kind of interrupts and, and traps, but the kernel also needs to have uh, its own memory in order to uh, allocate, say, data structures about which threads are currently running and which threads are ready to, to run. Other questions? All right, so let's do a bit of compare and contrast. in terms of how two different operating systems uh, provide an, an API for, our, for creating a new process. So let's first consider Windows. We have the creatively named create process and this is a function that takes 10 arguments. Uh, you give it, uh, and so it might look something like this, where this first is uh, a module name, which when we're starting uh, a new process might be null. Uh, we might take the uh, a string argument from the command line as the, uh, the kind of command line argument to this to this process. Uh, there are arguments about whether uh, parts of this process are inheritable by child processes, um, uh, and there is kind of six more arguments all about uh, kind of comparing all the different parts of how we want this process to interact with other processes. If we compare that to uh, the Unix approach, uh, Unix does the following. Uh, we have a running process, and this process says something like call this fork system call, and it's going to return a process ID, and then We say if the process ID is zero, exec, else we wait for that PID. And this fork, as the name suggests, 
is going to create a kind of fork, a branch in our, our road of, of execution where we're going to have two processes, one of which goes down this way, one of which goes down to wait. And the way that this works is that fork has the unusual property that it's going to return twice. Because we're going to We're going to take the process that called fork, we're going to copy it, all its, uh, uh, its kind of entire memory, and then fork is going to return zero to the child process, which because the child process is a complete copy of the parent, both the child and the parent continue executing from where fork was called. So fork is called, we create a copy of this process, both of those processes continue executing, one of them gets a return value from fork of zero, that's the new child process we created, and the other, the parent, gets the PID, the process ID, of this new child process. So then we can have code that says, if our return value from fork is zero, we know we're the child, otherwise we know we're the parent. And so fork is just creating a new process, the copy of the old one. And then if we actually want to start a new program, that's where this exact system call comes in. And exec is going to uh, take some command and replace the code that the calling process is running with the code of this command. So this means that if I want to start some new program running, for example, uh, we have the uh, bash shell running on Mantis. You're logged into Mantis. And you want to run Kimu. What that shell program is going to do is it's going to fork, create a copy of itself, and then that child, the copy, is going to call exec with Kimu. And so that will make the child process turn into, it will just replace the code that it's running with the code of the Kimu program, load that in from disk. And so now the child that was forked off is now turned into this new program uh, that we've asked the shell to run. You said that it copies the memory of the current process. I had thought that in the full process you could still like access pointers in the parent process to keep. Am I misunderstanding? So this is yeah, that's an excellent question, an important distinction. So processes, their memory is isolated from other processes. So a child process will have all the same variables, but they're in separate memory. It is a copy of the parent, so that they cannot affect each other's memory, at least not directly. How do multiprocessing programs communicate then? So, for multiprocessing, uh, if we need cooperating uh, uh, parts of a larger program, processes are not a great model because they have this isolation. and 
next week we're going to be start talking a lot about threads, which are a kind of, uh, which we'll see is a model where you can have within a single process multiple threads that are all sharing memory and then and thus can cooperate. When we're talking about processes, they are the operating system is enforcing this isolation of processes from each other. Does that make sense? I just thought multiprocessing is more performant than threads in some of these papers. Is that just uh, so multi, at least how I understand, understand the term multiprocessing, uh, is more general than threads. Threads are a particular way to implement multiprocessing. Uh, and there are ways that you could do it with processes, but those would be, uh, there would be a lot more overhead where that's concerned. So whichever process called fork is the parent, and the process, that, the new one that is created by the call to fork is the child. Uh, and you can think of when uh, Linux boots up, there's some initial process that is running that is never going to terminate. Uh, and then it might when we start up the bash shell, the terminal, uh, that is a child of this initial process, forked out from that. Uh, and then if we run the kimu command in our bash shell, that will be fork and then exec to start running that as a child of uh, our shell process. So how terrible is it if you like, like can you just complete what how terrible is it if you have a you know a, some C code that says while true like fork? Oh you mean like While fork returns something that uh, isn't zero, we just keep doing that. Uh, this is called a fork bomb. You run a program that's just going to keep forking new processes uh, forever. Uh, this is a way that can just totally lock up a system. Playing around with this this morning. Uh, Running this, Linux can set a maximum number of child processes, and this will quickly hit it, and it will just, uh, and the fork will fail, and the process will exit. However, if I had it print something in this loop, that locked up the system entirely, and I had to hard reboot it. Because I could not even SSH in, because the system was just completely locked up by this fork bomb. Um, so, uh, I'm sure you could make Mike Ty extremely angry with a small amount of CPU. No, this was not. I, could you, you not do this on, on Mantis? <laughs> but you could. Uh, so, Mantis may have uh, more <laughs> protections in place than the, the desktop I was doing at the moment. But um, you have accounts on Mantis uh, on the assumption that you will be good citizens, uh, <laughs> that assumption can change. So uh, be, be aware of that. Very short. So I'm not exactly clear like, why a child has to be a copy of a parent. Why can't there be a blank slate of never in that So that's, uh, that's a fair question. Why do we need to do this whole copying? of the parent. Um, so one, uh, some nice things about copying the parent is that the child can inherit uh, things like 
the table of open files from the parent. And so I want to uh, uh, fork a process, uh, a child process that to uh, handle some uh, I.O. with a file that the parent process opened, uh, that's a useful thing for fork. But there, uh, and I think the, the reading touches on this, there are people that argue that this fork exec model is not ideal, and that instead uh, we should have something like a single system call like spawn, which is something that's actually implemented in OSV, uh, that just doesn't make a copy of the parent, just allocates a brand new process and loads in some program uh, uh, to run it. But this fork exec model uh, was created with, uh, uh, as part of the initial ver uh, versions of Unix in the 1970s and has uh, proved to be uh, useful and efficient enough that it basically has remained unchanged since then. That's How is Spawn different than a pre-process? I mean, it's got nine fewer arguments, but... Um, no, I would say Spawn is, is similar to this idea uh, of create process. <clears throat> Maybe we'll get there in a bit, but um, like, what are the rules that create process has, and why doesn't the Unix system need those rules to spawn process and like have them not interact horribly with each other? Yeah, so this is this is an interesting design question. Uh, do we have a system call that at the time you make the call, you must specify all this different configuration? Or do you have a model where, however the parent was configured, the child is also by default configured exactly the same way, and then between the call to fork and the call to exec, the child process could change, could, could change things about how it's going to interact with other processes before it starts executing this new thing. So this is, uh, yeah, I think it's there. There's trade-offs involved in terms of like how you uh, the API you use for actually doing this configuration step. Well, if I'm in a process that's using a lot of memory, like let's say it's like 10 gigabytes of RAM and it's using nine gigabytes of heat, and I want to create a child process without copying all of that memory and having to swap, is there a way I can just explicitly say fork to an empty process? Yeah. So this is. A nice segue to the issue that will identify, which is that I said that fork is going to copy the parent's entire address space. The Parent process entire memory. Uh, that's pretty slow, particularly if it's a lot of memory that we're copying over. Um, and furthermore, if we're about to call exec, exec's going to blast over that memory that we just copied because it's going to initialize the child process to be some totally different program. Uh, and so all this copying of the parent's address space we just did. Totally wasted. So there's a sort of old way of doing this, a system call called vfork, uh, which says uh, that the child's address space is just going to be the parent's address space. They're going to have the same memory with the promise that the child's not going to change it before exec is called. But that's not enforced in any way. Which might be one of the reasons that, you know, 
this isn't really used anymore. Uh, so one way we can do is just don't do any copying and rely on the good behavior of the caller not to mess things up. Or basically to say, you know, use this at your own risk. It's more efficient, but, you know, there's no nick. Um, the more common is an approach called copy on write, which is We're going to create a new address space for the child, but the mappings from the virtual memory addresses in the child's address space will refer to the same physical memory as the parent's address space refers to. And any guesses for what the kind of third piece of this is? So that we're unlikely for not relying on the processes to just behave. Well, every time it tries to write to the copy this to its own space. Exactly. We need to make the pages of memory in both the parent and the child read only. So that in the case that either the parent or the child process attempts to write, attempts to make a change to this shared pages, at that point and only at that point When either of them tries to write to these read-only pages, it's going to cause uh, a fault. The kernel will handle this fault by making a copy of that page. So as soon as there's any, going to be any change to these shared pages, then we'll copy. Which probably means the vast majority of them we won't ever have to copy because they'll never, they won't be modified. So that's if either the parent or the child process does once the child process um, calls exec, does it not no longer have this problem where if the parent modifies something it needs to copy things over? Uh, yeah, so once, uh, once our child process um, So exec will uh, write to many of the pages of the child's uh, address space, will it, which will at that time copy this over. Uh, when the parent changes stuff in memory, does that also create a copy of it? And is that new copy for the parent, or is it for the child? Uh, So the, the first part of that, yes, when the parent tries to make a change, that creates a copy because the parent and child, their memory should be distinct. And so if the parent changes a variable, the child should not see that. Um, at a high level, it doesn't matter whether that copy is in which address space the copy uh, is in. Um, so maybe you can design it that you're always copying uh, and the child, or maybe it's you copy whoever is trying to write it. Um, but in any case, you create a second copy of the page and you set up the uh, page tables to have the, the two processes refer to the, the different pages. Okay. If both processes try to write to some file, like sequentially or something, like say the child makes the right copy first, and then does the parent still make a second writable copy and then it's like this empty, mm. not empty, but like a dead page that nobody references or? Uh, 
uh, yeah, that that's uh, uh, relevant detail here. That when we make the copy, we're then going to make both pages writable again because there's no once we have two of them, they don't they shouldn't be. There's no reason to have either one be readable. Well, in the um, scan or uh, yeah, in, in our slow version of, of fork, uh, the initial call won't return until it's done all the initialization of this new process, which would include the copy. Yeah, which is why on, on any real OS, we'll be doing copy on write, and you will make OSV do copy on write in our last, in our last lab, lab five. Yes. If you had a parent process create two child processes, oh, and one of these three processes tried to write something, would each of them then get their own copy, or would only the writing process create a separate copy of memory? Uh, or is that just like an implementation detail? I, I think that would be an implementation detail. You, off the top of my head, the child that tried to write would get its copy, and you'd keep the read-only copies in the others, but. Yeah, the, once you yeah, once you are dealing with a bunch of children, there are a number of sort of implementation details that, that you'd need to think about, like that. Uh, all right. Uh, make sure to get through the essentials before we have to go. So uh, first essential thing. is Zachary Taylor, 12th President of the United States. So, not a whole lot to say about, about Zachary Taylor. Uh, I've seen him referred to as a uh, forgettable president. Uh, he was a uh, general, uh, kind of became famous and popular during the Mexican-American War. Um, and then, as was relatively common in these days, uh, the Whig part, political parties would say, oh, this guy, he's popular, he's well known, doesn't matter what his politics are, he could probably win, so we'll nominate him for president. And that's exactly what happened with Zachary Taylor. He never expressed much interest in politics, no one really knew what his policy views were, but people thought he could win an election, and so, the Whig Party, uh, and so he beat uh, poor Henry Clay for the nomination, uh, uh, won, won the election, um, and uh, he tried hard and largely failed to deal with sectional ten uh, the rising sectional tensions over slavery. Um, this was kind of during this uh, time of, of territorial expansion, uh, Minnesota Territory, uh, shows up uh, during this period, uh, and there was uh, more, uh, there was this question that would uh, shortly kind of break the, uh, the states apart of uh, where would slavery be allowed to expand and where it wouldn't. Zachary Taylor uh, uh, died in office, not one month, like uh, Harrison, but 16 months after his election. Uh, and so next time uh, we will talk about his vice president, Millard Fillmore, uh, who uh, stepped, stepped into office, uh, another uh, fairly obscure gentleman. All right. So there's a couple other pieces to uh, the Unix process control in addition to fork. Uh, one of these is the ability to wait for a child process to finish. And so you saw me use that uh, over here, where uh, uh, the version that, that you'll implement in OSV is slightly different from the one in Unix. I'll just do the, the OSV one, uh, where
weight takes in the ID of the child process the parent wants to wait for, and then takes in a pointer that will be used to store the exit status of the process. And this goes along with so wait is parent is going to block until the child exits. And we also have this exit system call that a process can use to terminate itself and say, okay, I'm done running, I'm going to exit. And it can set this integer exit status. And the reason that we want this exit status is it gives the way a way for a parent process to check how did things go in the child process. Whereby convention, if the exit status is zero, that means everything went fine. If the exit status is any other number, that means an error occurred. And a process might exit with different non-zero statuses to indicate different problems. So the ls program in Linux that lists the files in the current directory, it exit status is zero if things went fine. One, if there was a minor error, like some subdirectory didn't exist, and the next set is of two, if there was a major error, like the top level file, the top level location you told it to list didn't exist. And so, wait can actually be told to wait for a specific child or wait for any child, the first child to to exit. Uh, is the one we'll wait on, and then we can give it a pointer if we care about the exit status. Uh, this pointer will be kind of updated to point to whatever the status of, of the child process was. And this allows us to make code that uses fork deterministic. Where when code calls fork, we're at the mercy of the operating system scheduler to determine does the parent run first, does the child run first, we have no way of assuming one way or the other. But if we have the parent wait for the child, then we know that the parent won't continue from that point until the child is finished. So it basically allows them to, to synchronize um, and have the order in which they do things be determined. Questions on either of these? Um, we said wait, wait for uh, the first child to exit. Is there a situation where a process of multiple children that would sort of cause an error or undefined behavior? Uh, so it may cause uh, non deterministic behavior because you don't know which child will actually finish first. But, uh, if you, the way it works, if you say wait with a PID of negative one, that just means wait will return as soon as there is a child that has exited uh, that you can wait on. Uh, or if you said uh, wait of uh, two, five, one, six, seven, that means this specific child process ID, I will wait for that one to finish before this function returns. All right, that's all we have time for uh, today. There will be a little bit to finish up with this on Monday. Uh, keep working on the lab. Post uh, questions on, on Slack. And have a good weekend.